us. Welcome to the webinar. Welcome. Welcome. Yes. Thank you. So an early morning for all of the speakers, I think. We are present. Anisha, if you send us the YouTube uh, link, I can share it on Facebook and the Twitter. I just checked and it is not there. We can live on YouTube and I can share this with you afterwards as well, after the session. And oh, I can I share the link uh, as of now also on YouTube, on WhatsApp. I'll share it oh, with you. Greetings everyone, I'm Sanjana. I am a law student at Geetham University, Vishakapatnam. Currently, I'm an intern at Red Lantern Analytica. We are here today for a webinar on CCP's Uyghur genocide and diplomatic boycott of Beijing Winter Olympics. A warm welcome to today's speakers. We are honored and privileged to have each and every one of you here today. I would also like to extend my warm greetings to dignitaries on and off the dais, as well as instructors and dear friends. My sincere gratitude to Red Lantern Analytica for providing us with the opportunity to hold this webinar on such an important issue. The growing atrocities by the Chinese Communist Party against the Uyghur community are yet to be disclosed to the world and the suppressed voices of the victims of the CCP regime are yet to be heard. Amongst all these brutalities, the Winter Olympics for the year 2022 are scheduled to be held in Beijing, China. This calls for the world to take notice of the totalitarian nature of the CCP regime, to take notice of the extremist activities taking place all around us, and to strongly stand up against them. This webinar precisely focuses on these areas to highlight the atrocities by the CCP and to call for a diplomatic boycott of Beijing Winter Olympics. Let us now begin the session with a brief introduction about the working culture we have in Red Lantern Analytica. Red Lantern Analytica is an international affairs observer group based out of New Delhi, India. It focuses on critical issues related to China with special focus on Sino-India relations, issues of national security, international security, energy, and environment. The main aim of the organization is to draw in India's foremost ac academic institutions and security intelligentsia, corporate institutions, monetary establishments, and experts in discussion on India's foreign policy and to extend the country's role in global issues. So this was a brief introduction about Red Lantern Analytica. Without further ado, I would like to hand over the session to today's moderator, Mr. Sindhu. He is a research scholar and development practitioner. He will be carrying forward today's session. Over to you, Mr. Sindhu. Thank you, Sanjana. Uh, good evening to all of us present here and good morning from the perspective of the speakers, of course. I am Sindhu, 
and I offer a warm welcome to all of you in this webinar hosted by Red Lantern Analytica. The topic that is going to be discussed today is the CCP's Uyghur genocide and diplomatic boycott of Beijing Winter Olympics. Even though this topic needs no introduction perhaps, allow me to say a few lines before I pass on the mantle to our speakers. <laughs> we live in a society that is continually and fra frequently fragmented by violence. For some, the presence of violence in our innate nature is testament to the fact that humans are, after all, not above animals. However, nothing justifies the crackdown of violence and ethnic genocide that is being faced by the Uyghur community in Northwest China. It is in the light of these events that we are gathered here today to hear some of prominent speakers on the matter. For this discussion, we have with us today Mr. Ilshad Hassan Kokbore, Dr. Erkin Siddiq, Ms. Julie Millsap Liu, and Mr. Jivlan Shirmamet. I welcome Mr. Ilshad Hassan Kokbore uh, for the first uh, speech of the day. Mr. Ilshad was born in Gulja, East Turkestan and is currently serving as the Vice Chairman of the World Uyghur Congress of Executive Committee and the Chinese Cultural Consultant of Uyghur Human Rights Project. Due to political prosecution, he had to flee from his fatherland to Malaysia, leaving behind his parents and family. In 2007, he joined the Uyghur American Association. Since then, Mr. Ilshat has gained prominence as a very active and influential figure in Uyghur human rights campaign. Over to you, Mr. Kukbore. Thank you, Sindhu. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for the Red Lantern Analytica for organizing uh, this event. It is very important, as you all mentioned. Uh, we are suffering as a uh, Uyghur and uh, this suffering is already lasted very very long uh, a lot of time when we think of the genocide it seems uh, to a lot of audience it was just happened starting from 2017 actually it was far longer than that since the chinese occupation in east turkestan uh, i would mention in here uh, before the Chinese occupation of East Turkestan and Tibet, China never had bordered with India. And India never had any threat from the Chinese empire. And since the occupation, we are suffering. And also the Southeast Asia, India and others, all is under the Chinese communist threat. And starting from my personal, since 2000, the Chinese government, after the 9-11, labeled the Uyghur as, because of our Muslim background, labeled as a terrorist, separatist. Any grievance shown uh, to the government from Uyghur side, all labeled as a terrorist action, and killed, jailed, our intellectuals was get arrested uh, and all of our books censored and this was keep going on that's why when i was a associate professor in a college and I started to show my refuse uh, resistance to the chinese uh, assimilation and they started labeling me as a separatist. And after I was arrested a few times, uh, tortured in the interrogation, my teeth was uh, broken because of their beating. And also they used electric uh, baton to electrify me. So I had to leave. And in 2003, I left, fled to Malaysia. In 2004, because the Chinese government find out I'm already fled, and they instigated the Chinese mob to kill my younger brother. 
he was killed in a daylight in a restaurant uh, at the early morning. And until now, because when I fled, I was on rush. I don't want anyone to find out. So I didn't say goodbye to my younger brother. When he was stabbed to death, he was just 27 years old. I lost him forever. Never had a chance to say a goodbye to him. And I came to US in 2006 as a refugee. Starting that point, I continued my activism, calling for the human rights, for the dignity of the Uyghur people, the equal rights of the Uyghur people. I write in Chinese, I give speech, and then in 2014, 15th of August, the Chinese security break into my elder sister's house at midnight. She was a single mother with two kids. Since then, my elder sister got lost. I don't know if she is still alive. I don't know about her two kids, if they are still alive or in jail or in concentration camp. And 2016, April, 15th of April, my father, he couldn't bear more. The trauma, sister's arrest, brother's killing made him, his health worsened and then he passed away uh, in 2016, uh, 5th of April. After my last call with my mother, until that time, I was having once a call with my parents, just ask them, are you okay? And they will say, yeah, son, we are okay. Just hang up the phone. That was always my father's word. Hang up the phone. We are okay. God bless you. And then in uh, after my father passed away uh, in 2016, August, I had my last call with my mother. My mother told me, son, we had enough because of you. All of your nieces, cousins, they can't get job. And uh, your sister, they are all have no job, no income. We are having too much, too much. So please don't call us. God bless you. That was my mother's last word. Since then, I got lost with my mother. Now she is almost, if she is still alive, she is almost 80 years old. I don't know if she is alive, if she is in concentration camp or in jail. I tried to call many times. No one answered the phone. Sometimes a Chinese lady speaking uh, say this number is not existed. And I tried my Chinese dissident friend, ask them to find out my mother. One guy even went to from other province to East Turkestan, my mother's city where she lived, Humul, but she, uh, he couldn't find out my mother. And so I don't know. This is my story. And in 2018, from New Yorker Journal, I learned my another two sister with her husband and their kids in a concentration camp. And I tried my best to contact with the one lady. She is now in living in Europe to find out what happened to my sister, because that lady was together with my sister for a while in that concentration camp before she uh, was released. She is a Kazakh lady. And I called her, I got her phone number, and she told me a few heartbreaking stories. Each time when I'm thinking of it, it's very difficult. And she told me, my second sister with her husband, with her daughter in that concentration camp, and my second sister have heart problem. A few times she was passing out in that flag raising or the Chinese meeting. And uh, her daughter, her husband tried to get her, help her, but the police not allowing and dragging my sister out from that scene. And 
you imagine your husband or your daughter's kids watching you passing out can't help and they are dragging it out what is a feeling and i am when i'm hearing that it immediately always come to my mind is my brother i was always asking myself when my brother was killed by the chinese mob stabbed to death in that restaurant is he called brother where are you can you help me if my sister is calling brother can you help me save us it's always in my mind it's not something far away even though i'm living in the united states i am having a decent job i'm enjoying the freedom but i am in concentration camp and spiritually and physically i can't enjoy any happiness i was yesterday reading the auschwitz auschwitz survivor Italian uh, plea more lavish book about us uh, surviving Auschwitz and in one paragraph he quoted another one survivor once you are in the torture and the suffering forever you will be in that torturing and with that suffering because you can't get rid of it you can't out from that we are in that Culture, that trauma, we are all in here, all Uyghur. We, everyone in US, in Turkey, you will hear Jolan Shir Mehmet's story later, and in Europe, most of us have the same story. Someone's father was dead in the concentration camp, someone's mother was disappeared in daylight, and we don't know this is a genocide and it's ongoing and it, less than a week we'll be in beijing the 2022 olympic and the international olympic committee with his president mr buck refusing to re relocate or cancel this olympic giving the chinese government as giving in 1936 to the nazi german a chance to show their power show their achievement giving them the legitimacy now the international olympic committee giving the china next in 2008 they gave once now they are giving second chance for them to legitimize their genocide, their rule, their brutal rule. It's not only Uyghur, Tibetan, Hong Konger, Chinese, Taiwan, and even India is under their threat constantly. Like this, a authoritarian government will, will in next week, we will see in the opening ceremony a bunch of happy weaver will sing and dance so the wall so that dignitary like dictator putin like the journalist killer Mohammed bin salman like the rogue corrupted politician imran khan sitting over there seeing this white washing of the genocide making a grandeur fanfare for the communist government this is shameful for the humanity for all of us because we are suffering i'm a united states american citizen i'm proud of my country but i can't watch this olympic because everything in that olympic tainted by my brother's blood my sister's freedom my mother's disappearance and also some others in here they will tell the same story 
We can't sit in here and silent. Like in 1936, giving the Nazi German a chance to continue its Holocaust. Now the Chinese government is copying the Nazi German using this fanfare not only to whitewash and also to show to this world how they are strong, how powerful they are, how rich they are. But in the same time, the Chinese people, the Hong Konger, the Tibetan, and the Uyghur, we are. And also the Chinese people, they are suffering. They have no voice in this. No voice in this. No any enjoyment with this Olympic. Why should it be held in this country? When a genocide, 21st century, a shame happening in there. And we are having this Olympic. So I call all humanity, I call my friends, all fellow human beings in India, in all over the world, stand up. Say no to this Olympic. We still have a few days. We can, in a few days, we can achieve a lot. I trust, I always believe in our civilization, in our humanity, in our conscience. If we stand up, come together in this few days, we can change the world. We can make up, make the uh, miracle. This is our power, people's power, if we use it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Kobode, uh, for a very moving account of your experiences and for pro providing us with your perspective on this matter. Next with us is Dr. Erkin Siddiq. Dr. Erkin Siddiq was born in the city of Aksu in East Turkestan, located in the northwestern part of China. From early 2018, Dr. Siddiq gave lectures in the US and around the world on the current Uyghur tragedies and Chinese government's genocide of the Uyghurs in both Uyghur language and in English. In June 2019, Dr. Siddiq founded Uyghur Projects Foundation, a non-profit organization registered in the U.S. with a group of Uyghur professionals to preserve the language, culture, and the ethnic identity of Uyghurs in diaspora. Since 2018, Dr. Siddiq has also been serving as the senior advisor for World Uyghur Congress. I welcome you, Dr. Siddiq, to present your speech. Thank you very much for your introduction and this uh, opportunity. It was I am so grateful about that. Um, as I was, as I just said, I was born in Aksu Prefecture and I finished my elementary, middle, high school in Aksu, and went to college in Urumqi, which is the capital of East Turkestan. Uh, electrical engineering major, I studied five years and learned three languages: Chinese, English, and Japanese. I became a university teacher, went to Japan first, after that I came to the U.S. in 1988, and I have been living in the United States since then. Um, I still have three siblings back home, and I never made a single phone call to them since January of 2017, because I was at the top, top uh, position of the Chinese blacklist, and anybody who contacts me or, or I contact, they will be taken away uh, to concentration camps or jail. And uh, I haven't talked to them since 2017. I didn't visit our homeland uh, since 2009. I visited three times in 2006, uh, 7, and 2009. And I met uh, with more than 1,000 college students. And uh, meeting with me or contacting with me became a crime. 
of the 2017. So all the college students are gone. They disappeared. Uh, that's why uh, I am doing what I'm doing now. I was not political originally. I was a very academic, uh, trying to help young people about uh, personal development, goal setting, those kind of things. But uh, our current situation forced me to do that. This is one picture uh, from 2009 with college students. Um, in this picture, you see two people. The red shirt is my uh, middle school, high school Uyghur literature teacher. He was, uh, he was arrested in 2018 and died in a concentration camp at the age of 78. He was a teacher before, later on he became the uh, principal of the mid middle high school, but he died. The other person, the white shirt, um, <clears throat> Abbas Monias, he's a, a the middle school teacher, initially later became a professional writer, wrote more than 20 books. He was arrested in 2017 and sentenced to 17 years prison. Um, the, this person, Mutalib um, Nurmamat on the on my uh, other side, uh, he came to US to study. Uh, he studied five years, got two master degrees, and they went back. But he was arrested in 2018, stayed in a concentration camp for about nine months. After that, he was released, but died. But died eight days later, in a hospital. The reason is internal bleeding. And uh, I had another person, I, I, could, I couldn't get a picture of it, but um, his name is Erkin Sidek. He was a, a one electrical vocational school teacher in Urumqi. He was taken in a, with a group of people to Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand in 2015 for a trip. When he came back, uh, he was arrested at Beijing airport. The reason is because his name is Erkin Sidek, same as me. That means the airport keeping my name or picture in the airport, in the custom, and he was arrested. The lead of the team was a Chinese, the university principal, or the school principal, he, the, he did the explanation, saying it's not Eric Sadek in, in the US, in NASA. This is different, this is my teacher, he's a good guy. But they said, it's none of your business. And they tortured him three days, integrated him, and he released him to back to Urumqi, but he died one week later. I can go on and go on like this. Uh, every year I travel around the world, the only thing I hear is the mourning of the people. Every family lost many, many people. Uh, that's the situation. And I want to uh, make two points very quickly. The first one is uh, Uyghur people abroad, trust me. So whoever gets some very important information about uh, the situation back home, uh, they send it to me. So I'm kind of center of, of information. I get, I live like that every week with the new information about what's going on. And uh, also from the, uh, uh, the East Turkestan, the, the party's central government in East Turkestan, also the central government official in, of the Chinese central government as well. So I have got a lot of information. Uh, I can, I want to tell you some numbers very quickly to, to show you the sheer size of the genocide, uh, what's going on in East Turkestan. Um, <clears throat> Since 2014, about 1.8 million people Uyghurs transferred from concentration camp to prisons, 1.8 million. 2.1 million Uyghurs were transferred from concentration camps to other parts of China. They were used for bioweapon experiments, for <clears throat> uh, the organ harvesting, uh, and also murdered. There are some reports by Peter Winter, you can look it up. And it is basically the Chinese government took those people not to keep them alive, 2.1 million people. So let them die as soon as possible. I call, them, I call it as a distributed mass murder. In the past, when people did the murdering, mass murdering, they, they dig a ditch and buried them. So people could find, find out later on. But China is very smart. Chinese are very smart. They just do a distributed way at night, and nobody can find out. But uh, we are losing a very large number of people. And since 2014, about one million Uyghurs were murdered or died because of the hardship and the torture, mental and the physical hardship or uh, torture. Um, we have another about four million people right now in concentration camps, 
and uh, forced la labor factories. The Uyghur Projects Foundation, uh, we hired some people to, to get information about the uh, forced labor factories in East Turkestan. We got a detailed information when the, when the factory was built, how many employees, kind of. The list includes 14,000 factories in East Turkestan alone. Imagine if each factory uses 100 Uyghurs as forced labor workers, we are talking about 1.4 million. In reality, all of those factories are much bigger than that. So we have a huge number of people in forced labor factories right now. And those people, the male and female separated, and they cannot go home at night, work 12 hours a day. So it likes a prison as well. Um, so if you add these numbers up, it's about 9 million. I got this 9 million figure from a top official in a police department in Urumqi, Xinjiang Police Department since 2014. So the Western uh, media still uses more than 1 million. That's not true. I brought up the more than 1 million in November of 2017. I met a person who came from Urumqi to, to, to the United States. I met this him personally. He, he gave me some information about a secret meeting. The government announcing that that year in 2017, in one year, the government uh, arrested uh, more than 800,000 Uyghurs. I talk, I gave this information to, to Human Rights Watch and they published, they published an article in, in January of 2018. See, the 1 million, this figure came out in the media in January of 2018. The size of the concentration camp doubled, tripled after that. And people still say more than 1 million. Now, there's one question. How come so many people can be arrested? The Chinese government only is, uh, has been saying, like a, a two weeks ago, the foreign minister spokesman said there were 11.6 million Uyghurs in Xinjiang in, in 2021. But the real number is, is not like that. It's not 11 million. The Chinese government keeps the population number as a, as a top secret. Even the population number of Han Chinese is not correct. They hide the number. My wife worked at, at, uh, as a teacher at Xinjiang University in the computer center. Her major is computer science. In 1990, when the China conducted a census, the, the computer center participated in, the, in crunching the numbers. But at the, very, at the last phase, all the non-Han staff were dismissed. They are not allowed to see the final number. This is how China operates. So the Uyghur population is about 20 million. There is a US uh, general, retired US general, Blickerson. You can look, up, look it up in Google. In 2018, he said there are 20 million Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang. I trust this number. So the 20 million Uyghurs know the Chinese government saying 11.6 million. So we are talking about more than 8 million people missing. So I, I, I just told you what happened to those people. The real situation is so sad. The, the loss came that we got, the Uyghur people got is more than, than the Holocaust right now. But the world does not know it. And uh, so far, the, nobody went there and investigate. I hope I, I am wrong, but the real situation is so bad. Another situation is the living people, how they are living. You see, the, about one million kids were separated from parents. Just imagine, you have a child, daughter or girl, three or four years old. Government took them. You can on, only see once a week or once a month, or if you're in the concentration camp, you can never see them again. How do you feel? Can you be a new, normal human being after that? Do you care if you're alive or dead? This is the situation that the whole Uyghur population in Turkestan is under right now. That's the situation. <clears throat> let me briefly just uh, let me see how much time I have. Briefly mention to you why China is doing what it is doing to the Uyghur people. Uh, many people talk about uh, from the religious background. Of course, the faith was the number one uh, crime in China. So the first, first phase of the people were arrested, all are religious people who prayed five times a day. 
And the second phase are the people who have contacted me or meet with me. I am at the very top list. All the people who contact me are gone. There was a um, university teacher at Xinjiang University. She wrote me an email asking for, for the PDF uh, file of one book that I published. I sent her the book. She was arrested and sentenced to 15 years to prison. Just one email. How I learned that? Her brother is in Japan. I wanted to testify about her in Uyghur tribunal, but his brother rejected reason. Their son is in, in China's, China's custody. They cannot get their son out if they speak out. That's the situation. Um, so the, what the China, why China is doing what it is doing right now, the main is there are five reasons. The number one reason is in 1990, Soviet Union collapsed. The, one of the main reasons is Soviet Union kept all the uh, non-Russian people or minorities uh, in, in their own land. They preserved the language, culture, religion, everything. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, all these republics became independent. China learned a lesson. This is their biggest fear since then, saying we cannot keep the minorities alone, separately. So China decided to have only one race. They called Zhonghua Minzo, Chinese race, eliminate all the minorities. If you look at Chinese official documents, they always say there are 56 minorities in China. In reality, they are all gone, assimilated. Get, got rid of it. Right now, only the Uyghurs and the Tibets are left, and the China are after them as well. That's the number one reason. Number two, the One Road, One Belt Initiative. There are two major land roads for this project. And uh, one of them passes through East Turkestan. It starts from Xi'an, passes through East Turkestan, go to Central Asia and the Turkey to Africa. Two of them starts in East Turkestan. One starts from East Turkestan and go to Wadar port in Pakistan. Another one starts from East Turkestan, go to Central Asia and Europe. So for this project to be successful, China needed a stable environment. And they always thought Uyghurs as a threat for this initiative. So what they did to the Uyghur people is a final solution for stability. This is the number two reason. Number three reason that China always are af afraid that uh, one day China may go to war with the US. If that happens, US can airdrop weapons to, in East Turkestan, weaponize the Uyghur people and Uyghur people will fight with the US against China. There is a Chinese general uh, called Dei Xu. He's a professor at China National University. Also, he's a senior advisor to the Chinese central government. He did a survey from 2009 to 2011 in Uzbekistan. And after he finished the survey, he gave a presentation at, at his university. There is a YouTube video of his speech, two hours long. At that speech, he says, the Chinese government has been saying the number one threat is the terrorism. It's bullshit. Actually, it's not like that. Actually, the number one threat is the Uyghur population. In Kashgar and Khotan, 95% of the population are Uyghurs. If one day the China fights with the US, US can arm easily 300 to 500,000 Uyghur men, and those men will fight alongside the US against China. I will this problem until to the end. I will not rest into solving this problem. So what you see right now is a solution to that problem. 70% of the males in Khotan and the Kashgar prefecture are gone. 70%. That's number three reason. Number four, the China needs land and uh, natural resources, but not human life, not humans. They have oversupply. Just look at right now what's going on in Xi'an, Tianjin, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, with the Winter Olympic thing and with the, with the quarantine, what's going on? For China, human life means nothing. They don't care. Uyghur population is 20 million. When China conducts census, the census area is more than 20 million. So 20 million population means nothing for them. Mao Zedong killed about 45 million people during the Cultural Revolution from 1965 to 1975. You can look it up.
So the Uyghur people, this is the number four region. Number five is the opportunity. China raised up economically, and they bought out all the governments around the world, including, including the international institutions like uh, United States. United States, I was told there are 15 or 16 committees, and the head of the seven committees are Chinese, from China. So the, the UN is dysfunctional, does not work anymore. And the World Trade Organization, same thing. World, World Health Organization, same thing. So the China see an opportunity to do this openly, and that's what they are doing. So uh, um, all the Uyghurs abroad now, we became crybaby. We lost so much. Like I have, I have many hundred relatives. I don't know who is alive, who is not, and who is in concentration camps because I cannot contact them. Uh, this is the world we are living, and uh, Uyghur people love social life, um, and uh, we have a lot of uh, performances on YouTube. I cannot watch that kind of YouTube anymore because I started to cry. Everything about Uyghurs are gone: language, culture, custom religion, you name it. Nothing. The, the February 1st is the Chinese uh, Spring Festival. I am getting a lot of videos right now every day. Uh, Uyghur people dancing. Uyghur people are forced to dance Chinese, Han Chinese dance. We cannot see single Uyghur dance. All the Uyghur dance classes are eliminated, even from the art schools. So this is a situation. It's happening in the 21st century. And uh, we have condemnation, criticism, and the uh, U.S. came up with several bills, but it's all not helping. The, the, the pressure, China does not care about the pressure. They didn't change their plan. They didn't slow down, but they are speeding up the pace. The, I got one piece of information uh, which says Xi Jinping decided in 2014 to kill one-third of the Uyghurs, lock up one-third of the Uyghurs, and they convert the remaining one third into automatons, or people who live, who are living in the in the Middle Ages, and that's what you see right now. Uh, the one third of the Uyghur population is about six to seven million. So at the end, uh, you can expect only six to seven million Uyghurs will live, but they will be converted to automatons. They only receive orders. They act based on the orders, not on their own human being like that. That's what we are heading. I don't know when the, US, the international community takes actions, but uh, what they will find is horrible, is more, worse than Holocaust, And but this is 21 century, and uh, it has been uh, seven, more than 70 years from World War II, and uh, the world is still allowing this to happen, and, uh, and even rewarding the, the China with the Winter Olympic. It's a stain of the century. It's the stain of the humanity. The China will not stop with Uyghurs. For China, all other races is a foreign races, subhuman. Just look up China's history books. They call other races subhumans. Only the Han Chinese are the full human. This is how they looked at other races in the past. And still it, it's rooted deeply in their culture. And that's what we are, we are facing today, and the, the world will face again. Uh, you can see that from the world, the One World, One Belt initiative, the, the China should be stopped. Otherwise, we are expecting a world that's not recognizable by the current human being. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Siddiq for presenting the facts and numbers that in fact paint a very grim picture of the reality. We also thank you for presenting your perspectives on the political motives of the matter. I'm sure it will be taken up by your audiences at the end of this discussion. Our next guest is Ms. Julie Millsap Liu, who is an advocate for Uyghur human rights. She has spent a considerable amount of time in China and after witnessing the growing atrocities against Uyghurs, she began advocating for equal Uyghur rights. Her background is in political science and education management. Over to you, Julie. 
Thank you so much, um, and thank you to Red Lantern Analytica for hosting this today and also for the work that you have been doing consistently to bring awareness to this issue, um, particularly for Indian audiences. We're very appreciative of that. So, you know, I think it's pretty hard to add to what's already been said. I think this has set such an incredible picture for the audience of why it's absolutely preposterous that at this point in time, Beijing is hosting the Olympics yet again. Um, I did have the experience of being uh, in China for the 2008 Olympics, and it was clear at this point in time, China should not have been hosting. And since then, the situation has obviously only drastically devolved. And so what's incredibly disturbing about this all, again, is the uh, our response as the international community and how we have refused to learn um, from past mistakes. And um, so to give a little bit of context on international response thus far, you know, we have just recently heard a verdict even from the Uyghur Tribunal in London, again, confirming that the PRC is guilty of genocide. And so um, it's really a powerful reminder when we look at some of the things that have been done that where governments have failed to perform their duty, um, we're seeing more countries begin to join the diplomatic boycott, but you know, this really was the bare minimum response to a genocidal regime hosting the Olympics. And so it's been left to the people to kind of step in and put pressure and draw attention even to the ways that the IOC is corrupt in the same way that it has been left to the people a lot of times to put um, pressure on the governments to act where they should. And so for a lot of our governments, they're still failing to fully recognize um, the threat that the situation presents. This is a human crisis. It should concern anyone uh, with a conscience. But beyond that, the implications of allowing China to get away with genocide and allowing the IOC to continue with these types of corrupt behavior um, have enormous uh, dangerous implications for the entire international community. And so just as a reminder for the audience, you know, it is left to us to remind, to provoke, uh, to fully realize um, the gift of the freedoms that we do have, but also protecting our own national sovereignty by calling out what is happening right now. I think that it is difficult a lot of times for people to fully grasp that something so evil could really be happening. Um, we're still seeing that uh, the average citizen in many of our respective countries is, is sheltered from the realities of what is happening. Um, and we're kind of being conditioned to accept that China is the way that it is. Um, and that's that's really dangerous as well. So even with what we've observed in the last few years, uh, in my personal perspective, should be enough of a wake up call to the international community with what happened with COVID. And so um, obviously this is a nation that should not be hosting the Olympics. And we continue to have leaders in, um, in the international community choose to believe that, you know, human rights is not their lane or it's it's uh, it's really beyond appalling. And so we're seeing that Uyghurs obviously and beyond that, you know, Tibetans, Hong Kongers, Southern Mongolians, uh, and as Ilshat mentioned, you know, Chinese people themselves uh, are, their lives are treated as disposable. And so the dynamic between the international community and China has really been quite shocking. Um, I think a lot of times people are using a lot of language that is kind of presenting it as if, if we call for accountability or we call out these things, we're warmongering potentially. And uh, we really need to continue to call on people around the world to recognize that, uh, you know, it's China, the Chinese regime's actions are hostile. And so we need to continue to lend our voice on this issue. We have to re reiterate to the world that China is not a country ruled by law and cannot be while the Chinese Communist Party is in power. Um, it's not going to acknowledge human rights. It's not going to be on the same page. And the worldview of its leaders is so fundamentally different than the rest of the world you know, that um, hostage taking behavior is normal. So just as we've heard already on the panel today, this is common behavior, taking family members and friends of, of people that speak out or are considered dissidents hostage is normal behavior that's openly defended. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, enough is enough. <laughs> we have to have this attitude. We might question how something so cool could be happening, but it is happening. And so um, we need to, to recognize that and move forward. So. Continuing to affirm this type of criminal behavior and the way that the IOC has done that uh, is, is 
not particularly surprising given the IOC's history, but what is, I think, shocking about it is with everything that's even come out in the last few months um, with disappearing a top athlete, with continuing to engage in this type of threatening behavior against international athletes that are traveling um, to the games. Again, these are all things that might have been predicted based on the response thus far from the Chinese authorities, but also from the IOC itself. And so um, I think what we're left to at this point in time is recognizing the IOC is not going to do the right thing. And it, nations have been slow to even agree to a diplomatic boycott. Many still have not. Um, is to do what we can to, to um, draw attention to the IOC's complicity and corruption leading up to the games, uh, to can you continue to use uh, the conversations surrounding it to raise awareness, and also to call on people around us to refuse to watch um, the Olympics. So, you know, being a unable to commit to something so basic as a full boycott is extremely disappointing. And um, my personal perspective has always been, yes, it really, really is a terrible situation for athletes to be put in. Um, but again, that is the fault of the IOC for awarding Beijing the Olympics. And um, this is something where we're talking about a life and death situation. So it is unfortunate that we were having to call on athletes to um, refuse to attend the games or to use the games um, as, as a backdrop for um, raising these conversations. But this is reality. You know, Uyghurs are facing death. They are facing genocide, the loss of family members. So it goes beyond loss of career or loss of prestige. This is a truly atrocious situation. And so um, we need more. We have to continue to use at this point in time the games as, as a backdrop to call for the release of political prisoners to, to draw attention to the fact that it's ridiculous that Beijing's hosting the games again. Um, and so, again, we have to to make sure that as the international community, leadership has to be more than a slogan. It needs to be more than just a buzzword. Um, we have to be really resolute in, in a response to evil. And that starts with examining the ways that our own governments and the IOC have been complicit. And we have to continue um, to use this horrific moment in time with the Olympics to propel us forward and um, to do whatever it takes to end this evil this evil that's occurring. And I'm not going to take much more time because, again, I think that just by listening to the stories of Uyghurs themselves, and as we'll hear from Jevlon shortly, um, what's happening with, with um, his family, um, this is enough to compel the international community to act. It should convict every single person of the ways that we have failed and failed to recognize the threat that the Chinese regime is. Um, we have enough. If we were to isolate any of these instances that have been mentioned, that would be enough to demand that our um, governments take a stronger approach to China and decouple, <laughs> let alone, you know, demanding that the Olympics be moved. Um, so again, I would just highlight that, listen to these stories and realize that these are not isolated incidents, that this is um, this is something that concerns every single member of humanity and how much so, um, how much more so um, recognizing the, the implications that this has for the sovereignty um, of each nation and, and the future of the free world as a whole. So again, with that, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from Jevlon and to engaging in conversation afterwards, but please hear what Uyghurs are saying. It's really quite that simple. Thank you, Julie for a very, very enriching bit. Uh, next with us is Mr. Jivlin Shermamit. He is a Uyghur activist in Turkey. He is the son of Surya Tursun, who was detained in concentration camps. He is a graduate from Istanbul Commerce University Law Faculty. Over to you, Jivlin. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me this chance for speaking of uh, for my family, and I'm very uh, happy uh, joining this platform. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Jawlan Shermanmet. Uh, I'm uh, uh, I came to Turkey for my education in 2011, uh, and then I just. Uh, in the 2012, I enrolled Istanbul Kumar University Law Faculty, and then in 2018, uh, I have graduated from there. Uh, during my student times uh, in the university, a, every uh, winter and the summer vacation, I have been to the, my family and been to East Turkestan for visiting my family. 
uh, uh, last times uh, I visited my family in the 2016 uh, October it's my last time I come to uh, Turkey yeah uh, since then I haven't been to uh, go back again visiting my family uh, because you know in the uh, from the 2016 actually from the 2017 no one in the diaspora no we were can go back uh, to East Turkestan for visiting their family. Uh, most of Uyghur uh, have lost in touch with uh, their family uh, more than five years, four years. For example, it's me. Uh, since 2018, in January, I haven't, uh, I, I have not been able to contact with my family. Uh, in in the two years, I haven't got any info uh, from the, my family and about my family. In the 2019 uh, December, I have got info about my family uh, from the uh, some relationship, and then uh, they told me uh, my parents and my uh, my parents and my brother, younger brother, were detained into the concentration camps. Uh, the reason is I'm studying in Turkey. Uh, and that you know, uh, the, the, from the 2000 and before the 2018, you know, uh, Chinese uh, authority and the Chinese regime actually, uh, they haven't uh, uh, accept that there is uh, camps, there is a uh, concentration camps. So they, uh, every time they said that there is no some uh, camps uh, like uh, you uh, talk about the uh, concentration camps. Every time Chinese uh, representative and the Ch Chinese authority. Uh, uh, told this, uh, they, they refused that there is a concentration camp, there are concentration camps, but uh, from the 2018, uh, you know, uh, August, uh, there is a report uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, you know, United Nations, it took the, uh, more than 1 million and the uh, 1 million and 500,000 uh, uh, Uyghur uh, were detained into the concentration camps. At that time, Chinese authorities said that uh, there is no concentration camp. This is an education center. We educated some people, who, some Uyghur people who need some education. And then we told them uh, Chinese language, we told them uh, uh, law, uh, blah, blah, you know. Uh, this is a Chinese ex excuse, Chinese regime's excuse. But uh, I just uh, want to uh, told my family members, my parents, my parents uh, working for Chinese government more than uh, uh, thirty years, thirty years as a civil servant. Uh, my 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 mother is accountant working, uh, work. Uh, she was working um, uh, trade and industry department in the, our hometown, and then my uh, father also working uh, more than thirty years uh, as a. Uh, uh, environment pro uh, protector uh, working for environment uh, protection uh, ministry and then the the post don't need any educated what the chinese uh, authority told you know uh, they, they can speak a chinese language very well and didn't know chinese law and my my brother also uh, she has uh, he has graduated from the chinese university in the, in the lanzhou and that uh, she is an engineer and then she also working in the cost as a custom in the uh, uh, kazakhstan and the you know our uh, my hometown uh, korgas county uh, border uh, in Kazakhstan and the Korgas, uh, what kind of educated they need? So uh, Chinese uh, uh, Chinese authority always lied in the world. They said that we told these people uh, uh, something, some excuse and the education. But they lie because my parents also is an example. And Mr. Arkin did also told, and Mr. Uh, uh, Ilshad Hassan uh, also told that their their family member also they don't need any ed educated just like my parents. So when I uh, when I learned this info about my family, and then I uh, just trying to uh, contact, uh, trying to contact with the Chinese embassy, embassy in the Ankara and the Chinese consulate, also Chinese uh, foreigner office in the Beijing, let them helping me contact with my family, let them helping me give me some info about my family, but they just keeping their uh, dead silence. They haven't responded to my question, and then after that I decide to speaking out to the world. I know.
uh, when I begin to speak out, maybe I will face some dangers. Maybe I will face some uh, uh, some uh, some uh, uh, dangers on the something difficult in the Turkey. I know, but uh, I decided speaking out because I I need my family because uh, I have to save my family. After my speaking out on the social media and the uh, different. Uh, platform in a uh, different platform uh, speak out for my parents uh, after the two months uh, i began to after the two months uh, uh, since i began to speak out i have got a threatened phone call uh, from the chinese uh, diplomat in the China, in the uh, stambul uh, uh, he's uh, they called me and threatened me i need to stop the speaking out i need i need to stop the talking to the journalist uh, and then uh, he said if i approve myself to the Ch uh, chinese communist party maybe that time uh, i can get the help from them maybe that time i can contact him with my family maybe i at that time i uh, i can uh, save my mom because uh, the my uh, my some relationship told me that uh, my my father and my brother uh, uh, was released after the, the, the detainment after the two years and my mom still in the concentration camp because the reason is that she came to Turkey for visiting me. Uh, so uh, Chinese uh, authority, Chinese diplomat threatened me, let, that, let me stop. Uh, Maybe that time I can contact him with my father, my brother, and then my, I can save my mom. But I haven't stopped because because this 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 I I do some mistake, and then so I have to prove myself uh, to the Communist Party. Uh, if I told what uh, who is my my relationship, who is my uh, my friends in the Istanbul, who I am talking, what kind of relationship is, what kind of. Uh, you know, organization maybe that time they uh, helping me. And the meaning is that they want to me, me be a spy for them. That time I can, uh, that time I can contact with my, uh, per, uh, my with my family, and I, that time I can, maybe I can save my mom. But I'm non-stop. I'm still fighting. I'm still fighting. Uh, one time the Chinese police uh, taken my father to the police station, let my father called me, stopped in my campaign for saving my mom, and then threatened my family, threatened my mom, uh, my father, my uh, brother, and my uncle, let me stop the, my activity for my mom, but I'm non-stop. I'm still fighting. So it's my final word. My, uh, can, can you imagine? Uh, can you imagine? But in, in the modern day, in the modern day, every can can contacting everyone in the world, uh, even uh, even uh, some uh, country also have some you know you know can, can contacting in the outside the earth you know. But me, but me, I couldn't even I couldn't contacting with my family five years. I don't know what. What is my parents, uh, my family's situation? Three months ago, I have got the info from from the, my grandma. My, I bought my grandma three months ago. It told me my grandma have passed away three years ago. But just three months ago, I have got this info. This is my situation. This is Uyghur situation in the diaspora. And then, you know, uh, after the months, maybe it's not one month. After the uh, fifteen days, there uh, there is the Olympic, uh, Peking Olympic. Uh, the China will hold the Peking Olympic, a uh, Winter Olympic, and the, some of country uh, uh, send their uh, representative delegation, uh, diplomatic delegation to the uh, Olympic, and then you know uh, they will come. Uh, yeah. Uh, they will share Olympic with the Chinese regime. I just want to hold this country. If you go to the, if you supporting China, hold uh, this uh, Olympic. If you support it, if you go to the China, and then share this Olympic, that meaning is that you supporting China committed genocide to Uyghur people. You supporting China rape Uyghur women. You supporting China kill Uyghur children, assimilate the Uyghur children, you're also supporting China, detain my mom.
torture my torture to my mom you supporting china ruin my ruin my family you supporting china ruin all uyghur family uyghur culture so if 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 this country go to the uh, we send a representative to the diplomatic represent to the china you have to thinking about this you have to simply think, thinking china committed a genocide you know if you don't if you don't do some real action, that meaning is you're yes supporting China, right? That maybe that comes that other dictator will fall in China. What if will fall in China? Do same thing. The world already, the world is humanity ready for facing this darkness world, ready for facing this any country, any dictator country, come to the same thing. Same again, the same crime against the humanity to the other nations. This is my final word. Thank you. Thank you, Jevlin, uh, for a very enriching account of your experiences and your perspective on the matter. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Sento, there is yeah, a sure, little sure. Yeah, addition. Uh, addition. You know, please, please. Uh, in uh, last year 2020 event, uh, Amnesty International have a report, uh, report about uh, uh, Chinese regime have uh, separate uh, more than 500,000 Uyghur children from their family. You know this uh, report. Can you imagine after the 10 years, after the 10 years, the uh, Chinese uh, regime will teach these children more than 500 million children, Uyghur children, without their parents educated, without their uh, cultural, without their religion. After the 10 years, can, can you imagine? The, maybe they will change a killer machine for the Chinese uh, army. Maybe they will do some, uh, they will do some, uh, you know, operation in the different country or the different world. These Uyghur children as a Chinese army uh, killer machine. Can you imagine this? Yes, this is my final word. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zevlan. So now we will move on to the question and answer part of our discussion. So there have been some questions that have been received over mail beforehand and there are some questions which are specified for our speakers and there are some which have been left open for general discussion so first i'll just proceed with the general questions anyone amongst you can choose to answer first question is what could be the role of international organizations like un red cross in preventing the the genocide or the tortures that the Uyghur community has been facing. What is your take on this? Anyone amongst you can choose to answer. Yeah, let me start with this. Uh, UN already uh, under the Chinese uh, control. UN, when it was set up in after Second World War, we know in UN chapter it says uh, for the humanity to keep the peace, to protect the vulnerable, uh, especially after the Holocaust. We had, uh, after UN set up, we had the Declaration of the Human Rights. And then in 1948, the prevention and punishment of the genocide, the second uh, international convention. And uh, UN promised never again. The never again is means the Holocaust, never again. But since then, we had many, many, but now the biggest one. And uh, uh, it's very, very irony and also very saddening. Uh, the secretary of the UN, Mr. Anthony, will go to the Olympic, sitting with the Xi Jinping, to enjoying the Uyghurs, Tibetans, Chinese uh, showcase of their uh, ceremony, fanfare, and uh, just uh, closing the eyes on the Uyghur genocide. 
just Shima Nath said, uh, Jawlan, uh, just now what he was saying. In that Olympic, watching it, attending it, you are sharing the genocide responsibility and also insulting us because she, uh, Jawlan don't know his mother. I don't know my mother and the three sister if they are alive, if they are in jail or in concentration camp. This is what the UN doing. And just let me point one more thing. The UN Human Rights Council uh, promised they have a report. They promised since last year, I believe early last year, and said they will publish this report. And the latest one is after the December 9th of the Uyghur uh, Tribunal uh, gets a final uh, recognition as a, the brutality of the Chinese government is committed in the genocide. After one week, uh, possibly around December 15th, the UN Human Rights Council said again, we will publish our report one week later. It is in one week, and until today, no. And the U.S. Senate congressman wrote a letter last week to the U.N. Human Rights Council asking them to publish this report before the Olympic, but still, until today, no any news. If U.N. can't do anything, I don't think the Red Cross can do what uh, something to change it. The U.N., the international body, all is already failed and it's become a puppet of the Chinese. And sometimes it's become a parading the Chinese propaganda. That's an insult to this international body. So I don't think we can expect them to do something. We need mobilize uh, our people in all the country, ask our government to say no to this failing organization. We can't keep hope on them. They are already failed and their leadership is already failed. Like International Olympic Committee President, uh, Mr. Buck, he was pardoning for the Chinese government, saying the Chinese government is good, they are doing best. And they're ignoring the calling of the people. They never listen to us. And uh, Julie can give more uh, detail. The Uyghur or a human rights organization and us already met last year, uh, before last year, with uh, uh, IOC. And they were promising they will do something about human rights, but never come back with any tangible something. So they are failed. UN is failed. Until today, the secretary of the UN never said one time even about Uyghur, about the Chinese human rights issue. No. So I don't keep hope for them. I just keep my hope on the people, our power. Thank you. Can I add to that? Yes, yes, Dr. Sadek, yes, please. Yeah, basically, for, for the knowledge of the audiences, uh, the Ilshad put the uh, UN very well. The one thing you might, uh, people might have noticed that uh, how come can China buy out so many people? The US FBI director last year during the, the Trump administration period said they are processing one case in every 10 hours related to China. Um, a lot of people got uh, arrested in the U.S. Uh, in relation to China. So there's one, there's one question. What is the magic that China use to buy out a foreign government officials, academia, stars, uh, kind of thing? The, it is well known among the Chinese scholars that China has a tradition to do this. It basically, they rely on two, three things. The number one is money. When the foreign diplomats go to China on a business trip or something, at night, somebody carries one bag of money to his hotel room. This is one way of doing that. And the same thing happens during the 
UN session in Geneva, for example, the, all the foreign de delegates are visited by Chinese delegates at night with a bag of cash. Um, this is very well known among the Chinese community. Number two is, is woman, girl. There are English books written on the subject by people who were approached when they went to China at midnight at the hotel room. Somebody knocks the door at midnight. The number three is the organ transplant. This one was added recently after 1990s, after Falun Gong, uh, where Falun Gong followers were persecuted by Jiang Zemin uh, with organ harvesting. The China now become a very attractive place to solve this problem. The waiting time for, a, for an organ transplant match and the transplant is one week. <laughs> If you're a diplomat, foreign diplomat, if you go to China and uh, you can get a new organ transplanted in within a week. This is how the China is operating. So if you pay attention, anyone, male, diplomats, government officials, academia stars, when they go to China, when they came back, they changed to a, to a different person. They become very strangely a China F the sympathizer. What is the magic? I just told you the magic. This is not secret among the Chinese scholars. You can talk to anyone. They all know it. This, this kind of tactic has more than 2,000 years of the history. China is relying on that. And they're using it very well right now. Um, you brought up the Red Cross. And to tell you the truth, I have never heard Red Cross in the last five years. And the, didn't hear anything they, that they did something about over genocide. So they are out of picture completely. And uh, as uh, Mr. Ilshat Hassan pointed out, UN is dysfunctional. I haven't written on, on my Twitter. Either the UN should be, um, should be rebuilt, replaced by something that works. It did a great job after World War II, but uh, it, it is doing nothing. Uh, except burning a huge amount of cash every year. But uh, they are not doing the job. It is not something uh, 70 years ago. Uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, nobody can stop China. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siddiq, for adding on to Mr. Kogbore's uh, answer. Uh, well, the hopelessness is truly frightening. But then, on the other hand, uh, as Mr. Kogbore has been saying, uh, there is the scope for you know um, hoping in ourselves as humanity to take a stand uh, against this um, matter and the reality that uh, that Julie was also speaking that you know uh, we are shielded from the reality most of the times and I think it's time uh, that uh, that reality is finally brought in front of people in a much more uh, democratized manner. Uh, so that you know people can raise their voices and opinions okay the second question uh, that has come up is that um, how have the governments of muslim majority countries reacted to china's crackdown on muslim minorities or uh, what has been the response from the broader muslim world and specifically from governments such as iran saudi arabia or pa pakistan Let me Jackson, start. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start. Uh, Julie, do you want to speak on that? Okay. Um, yeah, as you know, the Uyghurs were sold out by them, by all the Muslim uh, countries' governments, and also, also Turkic countries' uh, governments, too. Uh, for Muslim countries, they, they, they have emphasizers emphasizer than the ordinary people, of course, um, but the government are not. Governments are not. They, there are several reasons. The one is that they all tied up with Chinese economy. Um, the, the Islamic organization, uh, the Islamic organization the members, 70, 57% of them have a, the, for 57% for of them, China is the largest trading partner. So basically they tied up with economic relationship with China. Second is they all have their own human rights problem. You know, they're all dictators. They're not the democratic uh, countries, they're dictators. 
So criticizing China will expose themselves. So that's the second um, reason. Um, there are two more reasons in this regard that I, I cannot think of now. I cannot, Richard, can you add them? Do you know that there are four main reasons for this? Uh, yes. Uh, until today, uh, we are able to mobilize the Muslim majority people from the people, but not the government. Uh, the government always flip-flopping. Uh, for example, Malaysian government sometimes becomes strong after the Chinese giving them some benefit and then uh, backing up, silence. And Turkish government is the same. Uh, they can uh, jump and uh, using the harsh word to criticize, criticize the Chinese government. After the Chinese government sending a delegation, I don't know if they have the money bag with them. Uh, but after a day or two, the Turkish government will be again back up. Uh, other than that country or uh, other Muslim majority country, uh, one I would like to criticize uh, harshly is the Pakistan because a lot of uh, Pakistani citizens also, they lost their Uyghur wives or Uyghur husbands. They are also crying for their family member. They were detained in the concentration camp or some is disappeared. But the uh, Pakistani government, I remember three times I saw in the video, uh, YouTube or in the news, when the journalist asking Imran Khan, if you know, the Uyghur, under the, uh, your friend, China, was prosecuted, just crossed the border, and he said he don't know. And he, he just uh, pretending he don't know. He knows it, but the money is stronger. And uh, I would say the Muslim majority countries still not, uh, not yet come to the modernization, democracy. So the ruling elite was only care about their benefit, not listening to the people, not to following the international rule. Uh, so that's the re basic reason. And another one is uh, in some uh, Muslim majority countries, intellectuals mind, they still have the imperialism uh, leftover animosity about the United States or other Western country. So they're always labeling Uyghur issue as the United States is playing some political game against the China. And most of this Muslim majority countries intellectual forgot one thing that's very important. That is China is a empire pretending as a nation state. And actually, the Uyghur genocide is this empire's continued nationalism revolution. They try to make this empire become a nation state. Uyghur, Tibetan become the obstacle for this empire become nation state. So they need to get rid of us. And also the Hong Kongers and the Taiwanese and also the Chinese people who want to be living in a democracy life. That's the reason. So still, not only I would say add one more point, not only the Muslim majority country, a lot of uh, in the world, they're always thinking that China is a nation state. No, China never was a nation state. It's still empire. Thank you. Yeah, to also I, add, I, it's it's important to note and to remember that China spends an incredible, massive amount of resources investing in propaganda targeting these countries. Um, so we need to keep that in mind also that a lot of times this conversation is being framed in terms of Muslim majority countries because there's an expectation with these um, religious similarities that they would be the first to recognize what's happening. But in reality, also in Western countries where we would expect, you know, the free world and, and countries that claim to love democracy to be the first to address this, we are in fact 
the ones that are profiting off of it most. So again, we kind of also need to frame it in terms of authoritarianism being the key here, not necessarily that they're Muslim majority countries, because as both Dr. Siddiq and Ilshad mentioned, you know, civic society is a different matter. A lot of times when um, Muslim people in these countries do become aware, they are outraged, they are horrified, they want to be involved in helping. But the key here being a lot of these countries also have governments um, or systems in place that lean towards authoritarianism. So this is the key here. Um, um, so naturally, you know, the leaders of those countries are going to do their best to keep this information from people. And China, as I mentioned, is spending a massive amount of money on ensuring that this this face is presented in in that part of the world that oh china's building the largest mosque in nigeria and look at all of the you know uh, mosques that we have in china and look at all the ways that we're investing in you know bringing conferences to the muslim world about islam and islam in china and all of these very targeted propaganda efforts so we have to keep that in mind as well yeah i found the other two, two parts of my four reasons just, just for you take away why the Muslim countries are silent about Uyghurs. Um, many four, four main reasons. The number one is the economy. Number two is they all they have their own human rights problems. They cannot criticize China because it, 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 it may become their turn. Number three is all the Muslim countries control the media. They don't have free press. And uh, the ordinary Muslims don't know what's going on in China and what's happening to the Uyghur people. Uh, this is number three. Number four, the Muslim countries uh, have been using China against the West. The China is a strategic allies for Muslim countries to fight with the West. These are the four main reasons. Um, the Uyghurs are very faithful Muslims for, for, historically for a long, long time. Uh, after 1949, the Chinese government for, for, forbid the Islamic teachings from all the old schools. So like, like me, I didn't learn a single word at that school, any school. When my daughter uh, was studying at the eighth grade in, in the US, she brought back a social study books. It had one chapter for each major religion, including Islam. It was about uh, more than 40, uh, 30 pages. When I saw that book, I cried. I made a copy of those 30 pages because I have never seen an Islamic textbook in my life. But Uyghur people taught the, the religion at home and kept, kept a good face and the very faithful Muslims among other Muslims. But uh, like a uh, the, we saw that all the Muslims are one family when we face an oppressor. The Uyghur people try to help other Muslims during the crisis in Palestine, for example, in the Iraq war. Uh, Uyghur people collected donations in secret to send to those regions. But this time, when we are in trouble, they were abandoned. I have been telling this to all, to, when I give uh, speeches to Muslim communities, and I say, is it Islam we, le we learned has problem or Muslim has problem, have problems? Because they didn't treat us as a member of the family. We were abandoned. Uh, this one is adding another dimension to, to the Uyghur tragedy or Uyghur genocide. Thank you. I have, actually, I, can I speak? Yes, sure, sure, Please go ahead. Please. I, 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 just, I just have a quick question to the some most. Uh, I have a question to the Islamic countries and leader from this platform. My question is: uh, Are you scared with China more than scared with Allah? Are you believe with Chinese money more than believe Quran? Don't sell in your spirit to China. Thank you. Thank you, Jalan, for that call to all people who would like to act. Uh, Dr. Siddiq, you also mentioned a very interesting point in your speech that there is a culture of subhumanization, uh, so to speak, in the Chinese education um, world, uh, broadly speaking, where they are, you know, uh, taught from a very young age about the inferiority 
of the other races or other cultures so can there be a cross cultural uh, so to speak uh, rise or uh, what according to your opinion can be a counter to this yeah, the, it is basically called by the by, by this chinese uh, totalitarian uh, regime because they never accept the uh, democratic value the western value um the moral standard is becoming a huge problem in china right now you see in the in the west the religious institutions are responsible for moral education in ge in general the school teaches some moral uh, stuff but the mostly churches like in the us and the, and the mosques teach the, teach the moral standard in most of the cases but in china they they don't have this kind of system and they don't believe in god they don't believe in religion and they, they think the religion is a poison this is is um explicitly said in their propaganda religion is a poison this is how they look at it so now they, they don't have faith on, on God or religion, but they, they have faith on money in China. So they do anything for money. Like a, one example is the fake products. In China, the fake products is everywhere. The, the government are doing some work in that area, but they cannot stop it. People do anything for money. Um, so the, cult, the cross-cultural thing, the, the people, if you... Julie might know it. If you like a mingle with Chinese people, they always use this word low way, low way. Um, even the, the Chinese people in the in the US says low may. This is a discriminatory word word used against all other people that they call us low way, low way kind of. So uh, they think they are the, the most superior race in the on, on earth. Um, even though right now the China cannot say this openly in their the open propaganda, but uh, if you just chat with them, mingle with them a little bit, you will find immediately. Just living in China for a couple of months, you will feel that uh, you are left out, you are discriminated against in every aspect of life. Uh, this is very common. So uh, this low may, low way, the thing is one of one expression of that. Um, they, they don't, they don't, like uh, in China, in all other countries, the culture serves people. That's how it is. Culture serves people. But in Chinese culture, people serve the culture. There, there are two types of nations in the world. One is the civilization uh, state, another one is a nation state. China is a civilization state. So everything is based on the Han Chinese culture. So all the people works for Han Chinese culture as well. So uh, for other races, there are only two, two, two choices. One is to get assimilate or die. And uh, you can find lectures like this. For example, there's a professor in Nankai University, Nankai University. He has a lecture from 2018. He says this in the class. It's a YouTube video. He says, the nature of the Chinese people is the assimilation. We assimilate the good race and add to us, but torture to death the bad ones and eliminate them. He sings this in the class, in a in a class to the to the to the military students. Right now, this is how China look at other races, and that's another. I, I didn't have time to, today to talk about this, and that's that's the reality. So. Uh, uh, that's why the Uyghur culture is completely gone right now. You cannot find anything about, any elements about Uyghur culture. It's completely gone, replaced with Han Chinese. Uyghur people are not allowed to live in Uyghur culture, but live in Chinese culture. Um, that's, that's the situation. So uh, the bottom line is you have two choices, easy to get assimilated or get killed. That's it. Uh, can I add to this? Uh, actually, I feel uh, China had a chance uh, in after the Manqing dynasty was overthrown in 1911. China was to open to the world. Uh, it was a short period of the 
multicultural accepting and the Chinese people was recognizing the outside world. Uh, but it was very soon disrupted by the communists that took over of the country. So basically, I believe from my experience with the overseas Chinese dissident society, I believe if we can break down the China's uh, great wall in the internet, if we can get rid of the communist regime, then the cultural crossing, it's have a hope. Because the Chinese people also was a, in an open jail. They don't have any knowledge about the overseas world. For one example, some Chinese people thinking US now we are in chaos, every day dying a lot of people, and in the shopping mall, all is empty. Some people is dying for hungry in the US. And this is what the Chinese propaganda department describing the outside world. And even the India, they were thinking India is a chaos uh, place. No one is safe. Everyone is uh, hungry. No food over there. So this needed to be changed. That will start from breaking down the Chinese Great Wall in the internet. I know India is a IT superpower. India can do more in this, taking down the Great Wall of the Chinese internet. Let the Chinese people to know outside world in real sense. Then we can develop this cross culture dialogue enlighten the people who are under the brutal regime of Chinese for more than 70 years. That's the starting point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Siddiq and Mr. Kubori, for your views on the matter. Uh, we're actually over time, uh, but very quickly, I would just ask uh, Javelin uh, for your perspective on this question that uh, what should be the role of student activists or student organizations uh, in countering this uh, genocide and the uh, tortures and the brutalities because as we already know student bodies are suspect you know even in democratic countries like india uh, student bodies are not looked upon very well uh, especially in the situations where they try to stand up for human rights and it's against discrimination so what would you be your stand on this and how do you see student bodies contributing to this matter? Uh, yes, uh, actually in the Turkey also is the same in Turkish students also have some suspect, you know, uh, about the uh, Uyghur issues because of the media, you know, uh, some country uh, government uh, controls the media in the, in the Turkish, uh, uh, Turkey also is the same, the government that controls the media, so uh, the Turkish people actually, young people, uh, if you don't know more about the Uyghur issues, so, so but they, they know there is uh, some persecution, but they don't know the detail in the uh, uh, Turkey. So India or other democracy country, maybe it, uh, the the student have. Uh, has uh, suspect this is a normal but uh, there is a one thing we have to do actually human rights organization have to do some uh, or civil organization have to do, give a more chance to uyghur uh, activists speaking to the uh, the student when they uh, speaking face to face that time the student beginning to know detail about beginning to know detail about Uyghur issues because they uh, in the uh, Turkey actually this um, one two years uh, we uh, like the young activists uh, beginning to speaking out and speaking with a uh, Turkish uh, student and then the 
awake okay they can uh, be an open mind and then they, they they have the chance to more detail about the uh, Uyghur issues and then the genocide and then they beginning to uh, stand in with us because you know a uh, uh, student is the future of the country future of the world if they know there is a danger they will uh, face the dangers uh, will coming to uh, from the china they have to uh, take a uh, step you know uh, so uh, first of all the, um, i think that the organization civil organization civil association uh, will uh, holding uh, uh, the platform like this uh, let activists young activists a uh, face to face speaking to the uh, student uh, maybe that time we can let more students can join us and uh, working with us, uh, act, uh, action to action with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javelin. Uh, unfortunately, today we are out of time. Uh, I'm sure we're having a wonderful discussion, and this could have gone on for the entire day or week or months, in fact. Uh, but today we are out of time, and so we have to close this session for today for now i would like to invite uh, kashish who is an intern with red lantern to deliver the thank you note a very warm good morning and good evening to one and all present here it's my privilege to deliver a vote of thanks i kashish maheshwari on behalf of red lantern analytica proposed a vote of thanks to our honorable chief guest who have who spared their valuable time from the busy schedule to grace this event. Today, we had an opportunity to hear your inspirational thoughts and this will go in, and this will surely going to encourage us in our future as well. I would like to thank all the volunteers, participants and audience for making this event a grand success. Once again, I would like to thank one and all present here. Thank you. Thank you, Kashish, for delivering that note of thanks. So with the kind permission from our speakers, I would uh, like to ask that uh, if we can put this on hold for today at this moment, and then maybe at some other point, some later time, we can again reconvene to discuss matters. And hopefully, you know, the reality will be a bit, little better than it is right now. Hopefully, the next time we meet, so if you provide us with the permission, then we can ask the audience to log off. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. For Red Thank, you. Academy. Thank you. Thank you very much for yeah. having us. It's and our then, pleasure. It's our pleasure. Thank you. I am more than Thank happy you. to come back. <laughs> We're glad to hear that, Dr. Siddiq. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Javzan. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Mr. Kogbore. Thank you, Dr. Siddiq. Bye-bye. Take care, take care all of you. Have a good day.